science and superstition don't typically mix, so you find a surprising amount of overlap in these ideas when scientists work on cell and tissue culture. Contamination can happen for a whole host of reasons, and months of work can be lost overnight if a single flask is contaminated. Under these conditions, many scientists fall back on ritualistic, obsessive infection control measures or an attempt to stave off the inevitable death of their cells. If it's your first time here, my name is Jack Wayne, and I'm an Australian microbiologist and science educator. This is part two of our video series on cell culture. You can find part one going through the basics in the links below. In this video, we will show you a series of demonstrations of cell culture experiments, each of which is flawed for different reasons. Let's recap the key principles of working in cell and tissue culture. First, we work in hoods with laminar airflow that creates aseptic conditions. You want to work as far inside the hood as you can to maximize the zone of asepsis provided by the hood's airflow. Second, everything that goes into the hood needs to be sterilized or disinfected. Ideally, you're working with single-use items that have been pre-sterilized and everything else that cannot be sterilized with either high temperatures or harsh chemicals, for example, your hands, is disinfected with 70% ethanol. Third, keep your working space clean and minimal to lower the chance of accidentally bumping your samples or touching your pipette again another surface. Only bring things into the hood that you need for the experiment and try to break the experiment into stages with only the equipment you need for each stage in the hood at any one time. Fourth, you need to know exactly how many things an item has touched before and after it comes into contact with your cells. You want single-use pre-sterilized pipettes to drop liquid from a freshly unsealed bottle of media or buffer and transfer this to your cells without touching anything else. Conversely, anything that touches your cells has potentially been exposed to contaminants, so you need to very carefully control what touches what inside the hood. Lastly, you need to be gentle with the cells. Prepare any liquid slowly down the side of bottles or flasks where cells are not directly adhered. This is easier for the cells to survive and also lowers the chance of aerosols or spills from preparing large volumes of liquid too quickly. Already, this seems like an overwhelming amount of information, but really it's just scratching the surface of how careful some scientists need to be when working with cells. In this first example, we are preparing some media. Given the volume of media needed, a motorized pipette controller is used with a 10 milliliter single use pipette. I'll give you a moment to watch the clip, write down all the mistakes you can spot. The main mistake here is over pipette. Each pipette tip has a maximum volume and there are different sizes available. If you use the motorized pipette controller to pipette beyond this maximum volume, the liquid will contaminate the actual pipette controller. The top of each pipette has a filter to prevent the liquid from entering into the pipette controller, but this is not a 100% foolproof failsafe. Over time, any liquid that has compromised the seal in the pipette controller will breed bacteria and fungus, and any other experiments you set up with the pipette controller will be contaminated. This is very difficult to fix without dismantling the entire pipette controller and sterilizing, disinfecting each component. Avoid this if you can at all costs. In the second experiment, we are attempting to resuspend pelleted cells in nutrient media. There are two key mistakes here. Generally speaking, we don't prepare directly onto the surface of any liquid, but instead down the side of tubes or flasks. This minimizes droplets and splashes that may occur during preparing large volumes of liquid. In the video, some droplets spill onto the hood surface. This is inevitable and does not automatically invalidate your whole experiment. However, as soon as it happens, you should decontaminate with 70% ethanol and wipe up the spill before starting work once again. If you leave the droplets on the bench, this increases the chance that one of your samples will accidentally come into contact with this new source of contamination. The third experimental setup involves a simple media change. We need to remove the old media from a flask for cells, dispose of it, and add new nutrient media back into the flask.
Hopefully you could see multiple key principles being violated in that clip. The pipette touched the waste container after disposing of the old media. The old pipette that had touched both the cells, the flask and the waste container was not discarded and instead used to draw up fluid from a new bottle of nutrient media. Unless that entire 500 ml bottle is going to be used only for this experiment, you have just contaminated it by not using a new pipette. Some laboratories split big bottles of media into smaller bottles, for example 50 ml aliquots, so that they can be single use and this further lowers the risk of contamination running across multiple experiments. The last mistake is the lack of finesse in adding the new media to the flask. The cells are most likely adhered to the bottom of the flask, so any liquid that is added to them that is not designed to mechanically dislodge them should be gently prepared down the side of the flask to minimize disturbance. In this case, all we're doing is a simple change of nutrient media to allow the cells to continue growing, so the gentler the better. One last demonstration. In this final experiment, we're adding media onto cells seeded in 24 well plates. The first thing you should notice is that the hood is looking very crowded. This is not a mistake per se, but not every box, bottle or tube is being used at the same time. So the scientists in this situation could have made the working space more minimal and less crowded. The second mistake is not exactly subtle. You need to be always conscious of how many items or surfaces your pipettes have touched. And in this case, in addition to the nutrient media and the cells, the pipette touched the hood surface. Even though everything was wiped down with 70% ethanol at the start, the aseptic conditions of any vent surface inside the hood is very fragile and constantly changing. The next mistake is one you've seen before, just in a different vessel. In a 24 well plate, the cells are at the bottom of the plate. Just like in the previous experiment, you should pet the media gently down the side of the well so as to not disrupt or dislodge the cells unless that is your intention. Lastly, for any lids, we avoid touching the inside surface as that is what the cells are directly exposed to. The scientist here touches the inside of the plate lid and there is no guarantee your gloved hands are sterile or that your initial disinfection remains effective. All right, we did it. We went through that painstaking process together. Being able to look after cell lines is a highly sought after skill for science graduates. So hopefully you can put these principles into practice. For related videos on infection control, aseptic technique, or other videos in the cell culture series, all the links are in the description below. This is the Biolab Collective. I'm Jack Wayne, and I'll see you in the next video.